Hello, BookTube. A couple of things to say before we get started with this Middle March meditation. Firstly, I have a head cold, and that's probably going to improve my vocal quality because my voice, I can tell, is moving down lower into my throat because my nose is, is always a bit bunged up. And so th that's going to pick up better on microphone, but it does mean that I've decided to do uh, today's show in little clips, and that's in case I need a break to uh, use my box of tissues. And the second thing, if this meditation seems more biblical than usual, I say more biblical because George Eliot is always biblical to one degree or another, but if this episode feels you know weightier in that department, it's not planned, it's not choreographed follow-on to uh, the Richard Holloway review of his book, How to Read the Bible. In fact, when I read through the second half of chapter 9 in preparation, I thought, oh, there's not much here. Not much in this scene at all. Well, I mean, what happens? Basically, it's a short walk outdoors with some small talk, that kind of polite conversation the Victorians felt obliged to make, whether they enjoyed it or not. But then I went back, as I always do, and reread, and true to form, I realized that Eliot simply cannot do shallow writing. I mean, she simply cannot. And this amazes me. This is why I made the decision. And I was thinking it's nearly been a year ago, took the decision, I'm going to read Middlemarch very, very slowly. If I read it quickly, all of Eliot's depth, or a great deal of it, would have just passed me by. It would have been like scenery out the window of a high-speed train. <laughs> How's that for a metaphor? Okay, everybody, let's go for a walk. So we're going to go back to page 76. You'll see my notations there from the previous Middle March meditation. And you'll remember from that one that, of course, we spent most of our time inside Mr. Casalbin's home. Now, of course, we're outside. We're in an exterior, natural space. And you'll remember from the previous episode, David from Polyglot Reading joined me, and he talked about the symbolism of the various trees in the garden. He talked about how the lime or linden trees were associated with the feminine, oak trees with the masculine, and yew trees with death and danger. But then there's a wider concept now. Now that we've come outside, there is this wider concept of a garden. In English literature, I think certainly in the 19th century, if you have a scene in a garden, it, it doesn't hurt to consider whether we aren't making reference in some way to that, that weightiest of gardens, the Garden of Eden. So it's, it's not for nothing my review of Richard Holloway's book, How to Read the Bible. The book of Genesis places the very first humans, the very first man and woman, in a garden. Not in a wilderness, not inside a structure, but in a cultivated, a planned landscape. And this is put forward as the perfect place. And I think one of the things we can start noticing as we read this passage is that this garden isn't entirely a perfect place. So let's read. They were soon on a gravel walk, which led chiefly between grassy borders and clumps of trees, this being the nearest way to the church, Mr. Casalbin said. At the little gate leading into the churchyard, there was a pause, while Mr. Casalbin went to the parsonage close by to fetch a key. Mr. Casalbin owns all this land. He, he is effectively the vicar of this parish, of Lowick Parish. It's strange to me that although he is the owner and therefore the, the person most in charge, he, he hasn't, he's, he's left himself without access and that's got to be voluntary. It makes him something of an absentee owner and suggests that he's not particularly interested in his garden and perhaps more widely, not particularly interested in the parish that he's part of. And that is reminding me, of course, of the previous chapter as well, where we know that Mr. Casalbin isn't interested in his own trout streams. He's quite happy for other people to come and fish in them. And this is reminding me, not so much of Eden, but of another biblical garden. What I'm thinking of is gardens as symbols of female sexuality, and therefore the ownership of a garden being the ownership of female sexuality. Those who know the Bible will know I'm, I'm heading in the direction, yes, of the Song of Solomon. And I'm going to read from the Living Bible for those people who care about translations. 
you'll know that's a very contemporary translation, somewhat controversial, but I felt the contemporary language would probably be helpful for anybody here who isn't familiar with the Bible, and the King James or some other translation might be a bit heavy. And I think it'll make it easier, too, to see where I'm going with this whole point about Mr. Casalvin and the degree to which he wants to own or be involved with his gardens and his properties more generally. Allow me now to read. So this is the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 12 to 16, and chapter 5, verse 1. You are my private garden, my treasure, my bride, a secluded spring, a hidden fountain. Your thighs shelter a paradise of pomegranates with rare spices, henna with nard, nard and saffron, fragrant calamus and cinnamon, with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes and every other lovely spice. You are a garden fountain, a well of fresh water streaming down from Lebanon's mountains. Young woman, awake, north wind, rise up south wind, blow on my garden and spread its fragrance all around. Come into your garden, my love, taste its finest fruits. Now, Dorothea Brooke is about to become the private garden of Mr. Casalban. And I think Elliot is making these little points about Casalban's lack of involvement, lack of concern. Even the even having to get the key from someone else suggests I don't even care about my own access. And if we now take that as a metaphor, how incapable he will be of owning her in terms of her sexuality. That is, I think Elliot is already making indications here, as she's made so many others, that there's going to be a problem with Mr. Casalban when he acquires that garden, the garden of Dorothea Brooke. It's going to be like this garden. He's handed over or he's made it possible for other people to access that garden, whereas he should, you would think, as its owner, have immediate access. I'm going to abandon the analogy there, all right? Let's get back to what's actually going on in the passage. We're now with Celia. Poor Celia. She says, who has been hanging a little in the rear, <laughs> uh, looking for diversions, desperate for something more pleasant uh, about this whole visit. She came up presently when she saw that Mr. Casalban was gone away. So in other words, she wouldn't have said a thing had he been present. And said in her easy staccato, which always seemed to contradict the suspicion of any malicious intent. Well, let's see what that hidden malicious intent is. Do you know, Dorothea, I saw someone quite young coming up one of the walks. <laughs> now, I don't know about malicious intent, but when you th perhaps when we think about this in hindsight, we'll think, wow, it was, it was Celia first who said, Dorothea, there's something far more attractive in this garden than anything that we've seen so far. At any rate, Dorothea answered her, Is that astonishing, Celia? Like, I don't know where you're going with this. Dorothea, as usual, doesn't pick up right away on Celia's subtlety. Neither does Mr. Brooke, for that matter. He thinks this is just a bit of conversation. So he says, There may be a young gardener, you know. Why not, said Mr. Brooke. And then this is also telling. I told Casalban he should change his gardener. Now, what is Mr. Brooke saying there? He's saying... I have looked at Mr. Casalvin's gardens and I find them wanting. And therefore, I wonder, you know, does he have an incompetent gardener? And shouldn't he care about that? Again, a man who cares about the land he owns, who cares about the property he owns, who cares about his garden, will see to it that if he needs someone to help him with the management of that garden, that they're skilled and they know what they're doing. Mr. Brooks already said, well, I have told Mr. Casalvin, whoever looks after your garden, mm-mm. So again, another subtle comment, if we think back to the Song of Solomon passage, we already know there's something wrong in terms of how Mr. Casalban handles his pro his land property, and as he acquires a wife, you know, there, there's going to be problems there too. To finish the page, Celia contradicts her uncle. She says, no, not a gardener, said Celia, a gentleman with a sketchbook. And we'll just bring up the next page here. He had light brown curls. I only saw his back, but he was quite young. <laughs> Lovely. Mr. Brooke, still not perceiving anything uh, amiss, just simply starts to make another suggestion as to who this might be. The curate's son, perhaps, said Mr. Brooke. Ah, there is Casalban again, and Tucker with him. He is going to introduce Tucker. You don't know Tucker yet. Although one would say that Mr. Brooke should know Mr. Tucker, and should know whether Mr. Tucker has any sons, but Let's leave that for now. In cometh 
Mr. Tucker, and I'm going to say more about him, but I think first I'm just going to read the next couple of paragraphs through, and then we can return and comment. Mr. Tucker was the middle-aged curate, one of the inferior clergy, who were usually not wanting in sons. But, after the introduction, the conversation did not lead to any question about his family, and the startling apparition of youthfulness was forgotten by everyone but Celia. She inwardly declined to believe that the light brown curls and slim figure could have any relationship to Mr. Tucker, who was just as old and musty-looking as she would have expected Mr. Casaubin's curate to be. Doubtless an excellent man who would go to heaven, in brackets for Celia, wished not to be unprincipled, but the corners of his mouth were so unpleasant. Celia thought, with some dismalness, of the time she should have to spend as bridesmaid at Lowick, where the curate had probably no pretty little children whom she could like, irrespective of principle. Mr. Tucker was invaluable in their walk, and perhaps Mr. Casalban had not been without foresight on this head, the curate being able to answer all Dorothea's questions about the villagers and the other parishioners. Everybody, he assured her, was well off in Lowick. I'll stop there. Let's talk about Mr. Tucker. Who is he? Why is he there? Mr. Casalban is independently wealthy, as we know he inherited money that should have gone to his aunt and her children. And it's interesting, he needs Mr. Tucker for this part of the visit because, as we've already said, this disconnection that he has from his property is such that he wouldn't be able to advise Dorothea about the basic things going on <laughs> in Lowick. He has to have this other man. He has hired Mr. Tucker. Normally in the 19th century, an Anglican clergyman would know his parishioners and would be out doing all the visiting. And he might have a curate or, or a rector or someone to help him with some of the everyday administration, but he would do normally a lot of it themselves. However, in the 19th century, it wasn't unusual for an Anglican vicar to be university educated, to be a member of an aristocratic family, and so not really used to doing any work themselves rather used to having servants do it. And so they would hire somebody full-time who effectively took all the administrative work off them. And and I believe in previous chapters, we read to the effect that the only thing Casalvin did was preach a weekly sermon. He did absolutely nothing else for his parishioners. Mr. Tucker, it seems, does everything else. He functions in every other aspect as the vicar or pastor or minister. Mr. Casalvin cannot bring himself to care about anything living, really. We've already, we've talked about the garden isn't in the greatest of shape. Uh, Mr. Casalban doesn't know much about the, what goes on in that property or how it's being taken care of, but also he doesn't really know much about the people that live right within the village. And it makes me wonder, Casalban, he's making me wish I could ask George Eliot a question directly. I would say, I don't know what I'd call you. Couldn't, if I called her Mr. Eliot, that would be wrong. I'd, I could call her Ms. Evans, but I don't suppose she'd like that either. I think she'd want to be Mrs. Lewis. So perhaps I'd say Mrs. Lewis, because that way I'd get an answer to the question, wouldn't I? I'd say, please, is Mr. Casalban your picture of what God began to feel like by the mid-19th century? Had God become like Edward Casalban? Did he have no active part in the making or continuance of his world? Did it feel as though there were only lesser things, you know, caretaker forces, all the burgeoning sciences? And, and they all explain things. And if you have the right knowledge, like Mr. Tucker, everything runs smoothly. And so why do you need Mr. Casalban? Why do you need God? And what, what will humans have left to accomplish? I like this line of thought. Yeah, I'm going to indulge in it just a little bit more. We in the 21st century, we realize that you can have all the scientific and technical knowledge and still the world is not this perfect little parish like Lowick is. If I carry on reading here, where Mr. Lowick says everybody, he assured her, was well off in Lowick. Not a cottager in those double cottages at low rent, but kept a pig. And the strips of garden at the back were well tended. The small boys wore excellent corduroy. The girls went out as tidy servants or did a little straw plating at home. No looms here no dissent, and though the public disposition was rather towards laying by money than towards spirituality, there was not much vice. Well, that definitely sounds Victorian, more interested in laying by money than in spirituality. I can understand the Victorians thinking, will, will we finally, when we understand all science and all things, will we just have the world down pat? And will we have this lovely, perfect world that, that's a lot like Loic, where everything's just taken care of and, and covered and everything's just fine and nobody's upset or unhappy? And we know, of course, 
we know, you know what, you can get an awful lot of scientific and technical knowledge and still we don't solve the problems. And of course, then what do you do? How do you solve that problem? Mr. Casalvin would probably say, oh, well, you go backwards, you turn the clock backwards. It, we'll look at this paragraph again later to see that he's kind of doing that with Loic. Again, if you advocate a return to a pre-scientific mindset, the pre-scientific world was not great either. This is the human dilemma. How or, or if we can defeat the worst aspects of ourselves. Aspects which seem to defeat the very best efforts of faith and of science. And also, of course, if Mr. Kasabin is a kind of removed deistic unconcerned God, he just set the machine running and now he's not the least bit interested. This is the God that Dorothea Brooke is setting herself up to worship. This God will break her because all her efforts to serve, to worship, are going to be met with with nothing. But we'll go on when the text. The speckled fowls were so numerous that Mr. Brooke observed, your farmers leave some barley for the women to glean, I see. The poor folks here might have a fowl in their pot, as the good French king used to wish for all his people. The French eat a good many fowls, skinny fowls, you know. Let's talk about this good French king. It is a reference to Henry IV, also known as Henry of Navarre. He was interesting, but I've got to admit, I didn't know anything about him. I had to quickly educate myself for this video. But again, that's why I love doing these slow readings, because I have to stop and go, well, fill in your gap, fill in your gaps. Henry was baptized Catholic, but his mother was Protestant, and she raised him in that faith. He was the only Protestant monarch of France, and he's known for putting a temporary halt to the sectarian violence that was going on in the 17th century between Catholics and Huguenots. That period of social stability, as you can imagine, did help the French economy somewhat. I don't know if he achieved this ambition uh, that legend says he has, because we don't know 100% whether Henry ever said that he wanted there to be a fowl in every pot. Unfortunately, what stability Henry managed to achieve was overthrown. He was assassinated eventually by a Catholic. Now, Mr. Brooke says, your farmers leave some barley for the women to glean, and that's another biblical reference. He's speaking metaphorically, and he's referring to a principle from the Torah. And in the English Bible, it appears in a couple of places, but I tell you what, if you let me lean forward, I'm going to get out our King James Bible here and read from the book of Deuteronomy. Oh, it's heavy. Chapter 24, verses 18 to 21. Let's see if I can get there without dropping this Bible, because uh, you forget how heavy they are. <laughs> this is the New King James Version, by the way. This was, oh dear, again, if you're interested in Bible translations, most of you probably aren't. I had to be at one time, right? We had a big, there was a big deal about which Bible translations were suitable to read or not, according to the uh, the church that I used to attend. The New King James was still acceptable. The Living Bible absolutely was not. So, <laughs> but never mind. We are reading now. The New King James, verse 18. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. So you can see what's happening in Loic, if Mr. Brooks' observations are correct, is there's something similar going on. The farmers are obviously raising chickens and allowing them to roam free, so as the hens have lay eggs and have more chicks, there's extra chickens and the chickens are allowed to wander, and if people want to take advantage of those and butcher one and have it for meat, they can do. They're, they're common property, common property. So there is something Edenic about Loic. You know, that's the picture that we're getting, that it's of something very wonderful. And yet, for that very reason, it's also not quite believable. It it seems like a bubble to me. This feel, this loic seems like, almost like a time capsule. The, the quote here says, uh, there were no looms, 
no dissent, so in other words, no industry, and therefore none of the social upheaval or the deprivation, and that's what brings dissent. It is a little time capsule, but it makes me very, very nervous. I know that fate is not on the side of this little community. It's going to change eventually. And what we might be seeing is this last glimpse of paradise before the fall, if you will. But if this quote about a fowl in every pot is attributable to a king, well, we see Dorothea's Puritan strain coming through here. She goes on to say, I think it was a very cheap wish of his, said Dorothea indignantly. Wow, I, I, it seems funny to be indignant in this lovely, lovely setting. She said, are kings such monsters that a wish like that must be reckoned a royal virtue? Now, Celia, as you know, cannot bear Dorothea's notions. So I think she immediately starts trying to compensate for what was a really bad-tempered comment. So she says, and if he wished them a skinny fowl, said Celia, that would not be nice. But perhaps he wished them to have fat fowls. Now, the interesting thing I find that we're going to have to pick up really quickly with page 78 is that Celia inadvertently <laughs> turns Mr. Casalban into her ally because he also probably doesn't like Dorothea's strange anti-monarchist sentiment. That's That wouldn't be probably the way his mind goes either. He quite clearly has in Loic a kind of feudal kingdom on a small scale, of course, and one that he is quite remote from, but nevertheless, he maintains it. It, it, it is maintained. So Mr. Casalvin, oddly enough, chimes in with a remark that effectively says, yes, Celia, I think your viewpoint is possible. He says, yes, but the word has dropped out of the text or perhaps was suboditum, that is, present in the king's mind, but not uttered said Mr. Casalban, smiling and bending his head towards Celia. Oh, my goodness. And she said, who immediately dropped backward a little because she could not bear Mr. Casalban to blink at her. Celia, I think what's interesting about her feelings over the last couple of pages is how keenly she notices the physical. She's, she has noticed this mysterious young man with his light brown curls and his slim figure, which she only saw from the back, and his sketchbook. She's taken note of all that. And she also has a, a terrible problem with the corners of Mr. Tucker's mouth. And she has a desperately terrible time with Mr. Casalban moving his eyelids in her direction. <laughs> She's very, very sensitive about the physical beauty of things, which kind of makes sense for her age, really. But yeah, but it's amusing, nevertheless, that she she actually is almost shocked. She thinks, oh, no, 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 no. I didn't want you as my ally. But there we go. We'll go on to the next section now. Apologies for this photo of the page. Such a lot of shadow. If you saw me, had the time and the effort I'd take to try and get a decent page photograph, you would laugh. Let's read the passage. Dorothea sank into silence on the way back to the house. She felt some disappointment, of which she was yet ashamed, that there was nothing for her to do in Lowick. And in the next few minutes, her mind had glanced over the possibility, which she would have preferred, of finding that her home would be in a parish which had a larger share of the world's misery, so that she might have had more active duties in it. Then, recurring to the future actually before her, she made a picture of more complete devotion to Mr. Casalban's aims, in which she would await new duties. Many such might reveal themselves to the higher knowledge gained by her in that companionship. Mr. Tucker soon left them, having some clerical work which would not allow him to lunch at the hall. And as they were returning the, or re-entering, sorry, re-entering the garden through that little gate, so Mr. Tucker must have at least stopped to lock the gate and take the key again, Mr. Casalban said, actually, we should credit Mr. Casalban with this. He's noticing her. My word. You seem a little sad, Dorothea. We should almost applaud there, shouldn't we? <laughs> well done. Well done. That I hope that's not the last time he actually takes notice of her moods. You seem a little sad, Dorothea. I trust you are pleased with what you have seen. And she says, I am feeling something which is perhaps foolish and wrong, almost wishing that the people wanted more to be done for them here. I have known so few ways of making my life good for anything. Of course, my notions of usefulness must be narrow. I must learn new ways of helping people. Doubtless said Mr. Casalban. Each position has its corresponding duties. Yours, I trust, as the mistress of Loic, will not leave any yearning unfulfilled. I'm not sure how he knows he can make this promise. But Dorothea, of course, she says it 
earnestly, so she believes. She said, indeed, I believe that. My goodness, what a statement of conviction. Do not suppose that I am sad. She's trying fervently to make her belief override her feelings. Good luck with that. Ah, scenery change. Thank you, everybody, for letting me have that cut, because that's where I got a drink and was able to see it. I was a bit bronchial, a bit bronchial. Does that, does that say it without saying it? Now, this picture has significance because if we open up again, page 78, Mr. Casalbin says, that is well, but if you are not tired, we will take another way to the house than that by which we came. Dorothea was not at all tired, and a little circuit was made toward, here we go, a fine yew tree, not just any yew tree, a fine yew tree, the chief hereditary glory of the grounds on this side of the house. Now, that is why I chose this picture. In the UK, there are, I do not know how many, but I'm going to leave a link to the Woodlands Trust website because there are a number of ancient yew trees. This is something that I, I'm not sure because I don't think these grow in North America unless they have been brought over, which they might have been, but then of course they're just not going to be as old. But in England, there are yew trees which are several millennia old and are still alive. This is the other thing about yew trees. We talked about them being symbols of death and danger because virtually all parts of them are poisonous, fruit, leaves, etc. However, they also are symbols of immortality simply because they live longer than almost anything else. They live for thousands of years. And this is an example of one of these ancient yew trees. And the stems are the stems. <laughs> the tree trunks are magnificent. They are sometimes uh, the width of almost several trees put together. In fact, they look like a lot of trees just all glued together and growing out. I'll put up another picture very shortly to give you a sense of, of what I mean. But if you think about that, you know, these, these trees, maybe even this tree was around before people arrived on the British Isles. That just blows my mind. And so imagine, if you could, if a yew tree was sentient, imagine what a yew tree has seen. If an ancient tree could communicate, it would be an amazing source of wisdom. Because of everything that it's witnessed, everything that it's watched happen, everything it's watched come and go. And I, as I was looking at, up photographs of these trees, it really made me aware of, of my own smallness in terms of the time impact that I can have. My life in comparison to the life of one of these trees. Very helpful contemplation, to be honest, in my present circumstances. But I think we've got to consider this tree coming into this scene now. We've, we've already said that the whole wider symbolism of a garden. We have to consider, is Eliot trying to make a biblical point? Is she trying to point us back to Eden in any way? Is there any anything we can draw from that? And then she puts in this scene this simply magnificent ancient tree. This tree where there is symbolism of life, but also death, and also ancient presence. And I thought, well, again, if I could ask George Eliot a question, I'd go, may I ask, ma'am, but what could this tree signify except the tree of life and or the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which were both in the middle of the Garden of Eden? And any scene which takes place near one of these trees needs to be read with an awareness of the story of Adam and Eve, which is a story of beginnings, um, also awakenings, <laughs> also temptation, transgression, or what else? Banishment, all of that. And th that's the meaning load that we kind of got to hang on to while we read the, the rest of this section that we're going to cover and the rest of this chapter. Because while we note the, the beautiful scenery and all these inconsequential remarks, I think Eliot is planting this mythology here, these signals to make European ears kind of prick up and recognize that this scene is sketched and, and based on the very first chapters of Genesis. So let's go back to the text. No, let's not go back to the text because I promised a picture of the trunk of one of these ancient yew trees. Now you can see. I wanted to, to come up with some words to describe it, but not only does it look like several trees put together, it, it looks as though there are humans or something living encased in it. It's quite a magnificent thing. And if we go back 
to the text that we were reading, as they approached it, that is, as they approached the tree, a figure, conspicuous on a dark background of evergreens, was seated on a bench, sketching the old tree. It's interesting to imagine anybody taking the time to sketch something that might look like this. There's so much detail in there, so much, and, and of course, you know that that took thousands of years to develop into the shape it is now. I don't know. I'm not sure what significance I would give that, but maybe I'll think of something and come back to it later. I, I don't spare you my notes here. Uh, right at the top, you can see we're going to meet Will Ladislaw. This is the young man sketching the tree. And what I did do was read some JSTOR article. They posited that maybe Eliot's original intention when she was writing the manuscript was to make Ladislaw Jewish. A Jewish heritage is referred to on page 772 and 719. That said, these references are other people talking about Ladislaw and not in a complimentary way. They're, they're trying to emphasize his foreignness. Was some, were some sketchy ideas for Daniel Deronda already happening while Middlemarch was being written? And at what point did, did George Eliot separate out the, the characters into two different people, into Will Ladislaw on the one hand being part of Middlemarch and Daniel Deronda having his own book. Anyway, we'll carry on reading. Mr. Brooke, who was walking in front with Celia, turned his head and said, Who is that youngster? Kasaubin. Aha, uh -huh, yes. They had come very near when Mr. Kasaubin out. Probably now, whatever Mr. Kasaubin says will be overheard. And so he says, that is a young relative of mine, a second cousin, the grandson, in fact, he added, looking at Dorothea, of the lady whose portrait you have been noticing, my aunt Julia. The younger man had lain down his sketchbook, so he's heard that he's being talked about, and risen. His bushy, light brown curls, as well as his youthfulness, identified him at once with Celia's apparition. Her spirit. And I think it'd be interesting to think about words now that associate themselves with spirit beings or more than just spirit beings, certain types of spirit beings, right? We're in front of the tree of life or and or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So everybody hold that hold that meaning in mind while we carry on. Dorothea, let me introduce you to my cousin, Mr. Ladislaw. Will, this is Miss Brooke. Right. Here's the moment. In front of, in the garden, in, in the garden with all its broader meanings, in front of those trees, that tree possibly representing one and or both trees, we don't know, these two meet. They've now been introduced. It, it just seems to me a pivotal moment. Now I'm really pulling apart the language. The cousin was so close now that when he lifted his hat, Dorothea could see a pair of gray eyes rather near together, a delicate irregular nose with a little ripple in it, and hair falling backward. Now, those aspects up until that point are harking back to the portrait of Aunt Julia because Dorothea noticed precisely the same features in Julia's portrait. Then the second part of the sentence says, but there was a mouth and chin of a more prominent, threatening aspect than belonged to the type of the grandmother's miniature. Here, And the reason I have colored in these few words is I want to now suggest that Celia's apparition, suggesting that Will is something other than human. I say, okay, go with that. What is he in this garden scene? And I thought, well, you've got a little ripple in his nose, a shape which immediately made me think of something serpentine, and hair falling backwards. So if you do spend time in an evangelical church, there are some funny things that you learn. And what I learned was falling backwards uh, should be considered a sign of demon possession. And I don't know, because that's coming from an old memory, and I did not look it up, if anybody can help me, I don't know where I'm... I don't think it's a scriptural idea, but it may have come from early church fathers or something like that. But yeah, the idea that if you fall backwards, you're in the possession of the devil, so his hair falls backwards. But there was a mouth and a chin of a more prominent, threatening aspect. I did think that was odd, because I thought, well, how on earth can a chin be threatening but I thought okay if we're talking about if we're treating Will as maybe representing something more than just a young man with a sketchbook I, I just begin to pick up on these little pieces of language young Ladislaw did not feel it necessary to smile as if he were charmed with his introduction to his future second cousin and her relatives but wore rather a pouting air of discontent so it suggests to me that Ladislaw, almost like the old tree that he's trying to sketch, 
has moved to a place beyond pretension, that he's almost, he did not feel it necessary to smile. He does not have the motivation to continue with social pretensions for whatever reason. You are an artist, I see, said Mr. Brooke, taking up the sketchbook. That's a bit, uh, bit forward of Mr. Brooke, but all right. Turning it over in his unceremonious fashion. And I'm not surprised if the response that Mr. Brooke gets is a little unhappy. No, I only sketch a little. There is nothing fit to be seen there, said young Ladislaw, coloring, perhaps with temper rather than modesty. Yeah, because uh, somebody picking up your sketchbook, that could be quite private. But uh, Mr. Brooks says, oh, come, this is a nice bit now. I did a little in this way myself at one time, you know. There's his famous, you know, I did a little of this. Look here now. This is what I call a nice thing, done with what we used to call brio. Brio, translated, well, it could mean a lot of things. Uh, usually used as in, in music notation, con brio, meaning you, you, you play the passage with liveliness, with vigor. It can also mean with spirit. So again, we're, we're getting back to the idea of whatever will is being something, uh, more, representing something more than just his human self. Mr. Brooke held out towards the two girls a large colored sketch of stony ground and tree with a pond. We don't know if this sketch is the one of the larger tree. It doesn't seem to be, but never mind. He's, he's picked a picture. He's showing it to the girls. And Dorothea, so this is her first response to Will or anything to do with Will. And her first response to this young man and his artistic expression is to go, no idea what this is, apparently. I am no judge of these things, said Dorothea, not coldly, but with an eager deprecation of the appeal to her, meaning... Please don't associate me with anything to do with this. She goes on to say, You know, Uncle, I never see the beauty of those pictures which you say are so much praised. They are a language I do not understand. I suppose there is some relation between pictures and nature, which I am too ignorant to feel. Just as you see what a Greek sentence stands for, which means nothing to me. So there we go. Our first meeting of these two people is this young man is giving off one set of signals. This young woman is giving off another set. They are not meeting. And yet we know a couple of things about Dorothea. In spite of what she says here, that this is a language she does not understand, I think the language is a beauty she does understand. There are some things she understands, but she is choosing to bury or be in denial of those aspects of herself. And if we think back to the love she had for riding, she had a passionate love for riding, for being outdoors and just, just enjoying the sensual pleasure of the freedom and the movement of, of, of riding on a horse. And it could be an allusion to sexual pleasure as well. In addition, we'll remember Dorothea's reaction to the emeralds in her mother's jewel box that she pretended, didn't she, not to be the least bit interested in those jewels. I mustn't, I mustn't show that I have any interest. And yet there was a stone, <laughs> there was a piece in that box that she suddenly found unlocked something inside her, didn't it? It unlocked something more sensual, something... There There seems to me there is an incredible love of beauty or something within Dorothea, and she hasn't yet experienced it. And I, I think what's interesting here is we're almost... We're almost at that point in Genesis. I feel like I can hear the first verse, I think, of Genesis 3, and the serpent was more subtle than any other creature in the garden. That There we go. That's come from memory. More subtle. And I think here we see that Dorothea is meeting someone who I think has greater subtlety than she does. But we're going to see that in the next Middlemarch meditation. Yeah, I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger here because there's more to this first meeting. Thanks, everybody, for putting up with my cold. You're very kind and, and my funny voice. I'm going to now go away and work on a fiction book review, which uh, will give me a chance to rest my throat and come back. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.